everyone. Um, I'm Dr. Rebecca Naden, Director of the Global Risks and Resilience Programme at ODI. It's my honour to welcome you all to this round table um, on addressing compound risks of fragility and climate change, co-organised by ODI and BMZ at the 2022 Fragility Forum. Globally, about 80% of people affected by natural hazards live in fragile and conflict-affected contexts. And we know that structural fragility, issues of weak governance, political marginalization and inequality, unclear land tenure, drive conflict and violence and play a significant role in the creation of natural resource scarcity and environmental degradation. It's these drivers that also influence vulnerabilities that turn climate events into disasters and generate climate risks. And we know that climate change is eroding the already low coping capacities of institutions and communities in FCV contexts. Yet these communities also are among the most neglected in climate action and finance because of those very challenges of operating and investing in such settings. So against this backdrop, there's also been a lot of attention to develop climate conflict narratives which have evolved from the early discussions of climate and environmental change as direct drivers of conflict to narratives of climate change as a conflict and risk multiplier or as a trigger for conflict. And while these narratives dominate in popular media and are informing policy, the actual evidence to support some of these narratives remains weak and at times inconsistent and context dependent. So actually with today's event, I'm going to be a little bit provocative and ask, do we need to keep investing time and energy to prove those relationships between conflict and disasters and climate change, which means effectively we keep just describing the problem, or do we need to actually invest more time and energy in bridging the action gap? So with that in mind, the aim of today's event is to discuss how to operationally bring conflict sensitive disaster risk management and climate adaptation into humanitarian and development approaches and to reflect on existing challenges for bridging the silos and frame actions for moving forward on strengthening approaches for saving lives and building resilience in dynamic fragile and conflict affected co contexts. So in order to open the event we're going to have a couple of keynote speeches here from the State Secretary for the German Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, Mr. Jochen Flassbard, and Her Excellency, Vice President for the Economic Community of West African States, Madam Finder Kamora. So I'd like to invite the State Secretary Flassbard to give his opening remarks. State Secretary, the floor is yours. Thank you, Rebecca, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues uh, and friends, let me uh, thank at the outset uh, ODI for organizing uh, this very uh, important um, event um, and um, thanks also for, for having me here uh, to participate and to give an input um, outlining the perspective of the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation uh, and Development. Uh, colleagues, uh, fragility uh, is a challenge in itself. Uh, and uh, climate change uh, is also a challenge we are facing more and more in more and more parts of the world uh, and it's happening already through an increased number uh, of uh, natural disasters uh, caused by climate change but this is not happening in parallel um, it is uh, the, the climate change we are facing ex is accelerating the challenges we uh, face uh, with fragility. Today's panel brings together uh, participants with practical uh, expertise in three different uh, fields, climate change adaptation, disaster risk management, and peace building. The so close cooperation among these three community is in my view, uh, crucial to successfully um, and effectively work in fragile contexts. The colleagues, we um, have to uh, confess global change, ch uh, global challenges from violent uh, conflicts, political unrest, and the climate uh, crisis and the pandemic are at a peak. In the last decade, the number um, of violent conflicts has tripled. The last uh, and third addition to that we are facing now, we see uh, Russian aggression with the war in Ukraine. Apart from the number 
of conflicts, risks are becoming more and more complex, and they have unprecedented capacity to cascade across systems. Fragility is not limited to local uh, and regional contexts. It's a global challenge. Fragility, in my view, is the biggest obstacle uh, to achieving uh, our sustainable development uh, goals. The fragility experienced by uh, many partner countries has social, economic, and political dim dimensions. Coming to the topic of today's conference, climate change and nat natural disasters are increasing risk and exposures. How can administrations uh, develop national plans for disaster preparedness if they already have only limited capacity to meet the basic needs of the population. And by the same token, climate-induced uh, disasters are also highly likely to increase the risk of violent conflict as they place an additional burden on people already struggling in fragile situations. Disasters also often lead to an increase in internally displaced people or refugees. 80% of the people affected by disasters worldwide already live in fragile contexts. In our view, therefore, addressing fragility requires an integrated approach. We must jointly focus our effort on addressing the multifaceted dim dimensions of fragility, its root causes and effects. And we need to treat climate change not as an additional challenge, as I said, but as a highly relevant uh, as highly relevant for achieving development security and peace objectives otherwise we will fail in my view to achieve the uh, sdgs of our common 2030 agenda the german development cooperation builds on three key cr uh, criteria i want to elaborate a little bit on uh, synergies prevention and local capacities Number one, synergies. Our cooperation focuses on synergies between humanitarian actors, development, cooperation, and peace building. Our transitional development assistance is aimed at building bridges between these three. We implement context bridges between these three, and we implement context specific and multi sectoral measures to make. Apologies, everybody. We had a slight technical hitch there. But I think the problem has now been resolved, and I would like to hand back to the State Secretary um, to continue his um, address. Thanks, Rebecca. And my understanding is that I don't start from the beginning, but that I continue. I just uh, said that Germany supports the global facility uh, for disaster reduction and recovery and the state and peace building fund. We also supported the World Bank, regional development banks, and the IMF. Uh, in developing fragility, conflict, and violence uh, strategies. Finally, to my statement, it is our joint responsibility to create just conditions for development progress for all people. What we should continue working on together is improving instruments and coordination to make adaptation to climate change and disaster risk management more effective in fragile contexts, and we should strengthen resilience and social security systems in the societies of our partner countries. And finally, it's about simplifying procedures to become more flexible. Uh, close coordination and coherence amongst international partners is key to success. Today's uh, dialogue between national and local levels, between bilateral and multilateral actors reflects this. Together, we need to move from managing disasters uh, to managing disaster and climate uh, risk in context of fragility. Thanks a lot uh, for having me again uh, and looking forward to the other statements. Thank you very much, State Secretary, and apologies that your um, intervention was interrupted by the technical hitch. But I just wanted to pick up on the point that you mentioned about um, fragility being a global challenge. Um, I think that's a really important um, one to have in our minds. Um, and also, um, as you highlighted, the focus of your work around building synergies, prevention and, and enhancing local capacities. Um, and as well as that reference there to simplifying some of the procedures and being more flexible. Um, I know that many um, partner countries and agencies really welcome um, that approach. Um, so thank you very much. Um, I would now like to turn um, to Her Excellency, um, Madam Finda Kamora, who's the Vice President of the Economic Community of West African States, um, to share her 
perspective um, on this topic. Madam Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rachel. I'd like to also thank ODI for giving ECOWAS an opportunity to address all, all of you. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, climate change has put a strain on the economies of Africa and those of the ECOWAS region, especially in areas where public services are almost non-existent and where recurrent conflicts have destroyed social cohesion. It has exposed millions of our people to food insecurity, especially in predominantly agricultural regions and regions you know, with problems with climate change. Despite numerous adaptation initiatives that our member states are putting in place, often with the support of a lot of you, our technical and financial partners, the ECOWAS region is still suffering from the effects of climate change. For example, the increasing high temperatures have favored the spread of diseases such as West Nile virus, Lyme disease, malaria, and waterborne diseases such as cholera. And, you know, we're seeing a, a serious impact on the Sahelian and coastal areas where we're expecting on the one hand, increasingly long droughts, and on the other hand, the retreat of the coastline in our coastline cities. We're currently experiencing the seasonal drying up of many of our rivers. The Lake Chad Basin is one example. The silting up of rivers, the impoverishment and degradation of biodiversity and its negative impact on our populations. Several countries in Africa are classified as fragile states and as such cannot easily mit mitigate or adapt to the current pace of climate change. As you know, fragile states, you know, refer to, of course, failed, failing and recovering states. Many of our states are experiencing structural vulnerabilities, which also includes conflicts, crisis, insurgencies, factions and other challenges. Unfortunately, many West African countries are finding themselves in this category. In the face of all these calamities, and in the context of a lack of resources to manage the crisis and help the populations to adapt, it is imperative to find appropriate solutions to the combined neg negative effects we've mentioned above. I'd like to recommend a few things. One, we need to invest in governance and local development. I want to especially mention, you know, the fact that climate change and adverse weather events are eroding the resilience of communities and making them more vulnerable to predation by armed groups and the manipulation of our elites. Some of our armed groups are recruited from the youth in the communities whose livelihoods have been disrupted by climate challenges. National and local government policies towards farmers and herders, what we call transhumans, can fuel unequal access to resources and contribute to an increased risk of violent conflict. Promoting good governance and local development are therefore some means to achieving inclusiveness and the participation of people and communities. It would also allow our population to have access to public services to meet their basic needs. I want to mention the case of Northern Mali, both the North and the Central area of Mopti, where we have seen the recruitment of jihadists amongst youth and populations affected by environmental disasters and where vulnerability is really illustrative. In central Mali, Fulani herders and Dogon farmers have been fighting over access to scarce water and grazing resources for decades. The Fulani have been accused rightly or wrongly of being recruited into the ranks of terrorist jihadists since 2012. This has led to serious conflicts between the herders and farmers in the form of attacks and reprisals. Everybody is aware of the Ogosago massacre of March 2019, where more than 157 civilians were killed by militias in one night. This illustrates the link between climate, security, and fragility. It also witnessed another attack in February 2020, where almost 21 people were massacred. We also have to look at natural resource governance, and they must be climate and conflict sensitive. I want to refer specifically to the Niger Delta region in the Middle Belt area of northern of Nigeria, and the escalating conflict between the Boko Haram and the fishermen, herders, and farming communities in the Lake Chad Basin over control of water resources, 
fishing and livestock, and these are all linked to the dwindling waters of the Lake Chad Basin. We also have to look at humanitarian assistance and peace building, and they must also be climate sensitive. In the face of these challenges, it is very necessary to strengthen the resilience of our communities, member states, and the vulnerable population in particular. For example, in the case of flooding, our member states and the National Early Warning Response Centers and disaster management agencies must provide aid and humanitarian assistance to victims with the support from our technical partners and of course, the national governments themselves. Just as the previous speaker stated, our national strategic plans must be holistic and they must be aligned with regional and international plans and programs that address you know, climate change. We need to build the capacity of all these stakeholders if we are to succeed. I also want to address the issue of climate resilient economic growth and development. Member states in our ECOWAS region should promote resilient agriculture and infrastructure systems. For example, they must use higher standards and norms that are adapted with floods, climate change, and unpredictable weather events. There's a need to strengthen the resilience and livelihoods of our vulnerable people, especially the rural poor. We must also promote human rights and gender and the fight against inequalities and violence in all forms. This is because it is widely accepted from various studies that women are disproportionately affected by climate change, environmental degradation, conflicts, and natural disasters. Women who make up 80% of the world's environmentally displaced people are more likely to be affected by natural disasters. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in spite of all our efforts, we must expect more support from our partners in order to consolidate the implementation of a lot of policies and strategies that we've put in place. One other area we want to highlight is improving climatic and hydrological data. As we know, changes in rainfall and seasonal patterns can generate and aggravate violent conflicts over access to limited and unevenly distributed resources. So there's a strong need for our systems and um, institutions, you know, to have reliable data that would help them better forecast and provide adequate responses in our member states. Access to weather services to high resolution meteorological tools useful for crop assessment and the monitoring of surface and groundwater remain also very necessary. In terms of food security, we need to support climate resilient livelihoods. ECOWAS has its food reserve, which we're dealing with and we're trying to improve on. And also we need to promote peace and security. And in one area, ECOWAS has put in place its priority action to combat terrorism. It is important that we look at these in the fragile states which are already hard hit by climate change. We also need to strengthen social cohesion. The promotion of initiatives to strengthen social cohesion with the participation of community leaders, religious leaders, and leaders from women's groups and youth groups is one of the best ways to preserve social peace. The case of Central Mali, as I said, you know, with so many community conflicts between the Fulani and the Dogon tribes over control of natural resources is one area in which we can use these stakeholders and leaders to create social co co um, cohesion. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to call for the continued commitment to the various climate agreements that have been put in place as a guarantee for the security for all and to propose the continuation of efforts by all actors to mitigate against high greenhouse gas emissions. This includes, of course, the development of relevant technologies in the area of renewable energy, training, and awareness raising for the mitigation of man-made greenhouse gases, and the promotion of sustainable transportation tools and mechanisms. In this race for sustainable development, gender equality, and women's empowerment, we must promote all of these in a holistic manner through the integration of policies, strategies, and programs relating to climate change and human security, especially for the eradication of vulnerabilities and crises in our member states. We can only achieve this with support from all of you development partners. 
It is with these words I declare open the World Bank Forum on the theme solutions to address the combined risks of the fragility and climate change. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Madam Vice President. Thank you very much for um, outlining there the importance actually of taking um, a, a systems approach, both at the policy level, finance, operationally, um, and, and in terms of data as well. Um, and I think your points about stressing the need to address um, issues of, of good governance um, and also at the natural resource um, level is, is really, really um, important. Um, thank you very much. And thank you so much for um, opening um, our session with such a really informative overview um, and with those set of recommendations. Thank you very much. Um, I would now like to um, turn to our panellists. Um, I'm going to introduce them um, and then I've got a couple of questions um, for them, building on what we've heard from um, our two um, keynote speakers. So I'm delighted to be joined today um, by Mr. Niels Holm Nielsen, who's the head of the GFDRR and the World Bank's Group Technical Lead for Resilience and Disaster Risk Management. Also, um, Catherine Wong, um, a policy specialist on climate and security risk um, and the technical lead on climate and security within the UN Development Programme Global Policy Network, and Dieter Rotenberger, head of JIZ's Water Policy Innovations for Resilience program. So my first question um, actually to all three of you is, at the moment, what are we currently doing to address both disaster and climate risks and drivers of conflict and fragility? Um, and what lessons um, have we learned thus far? Um, Niels, perhaps I could go to you first to bring in the DRR perspective. Thank you, Rebecca, and, and thanks a lot for inviting me to, to participate in this interesting event. Um, so we heard from uh, both keynote speakers that disaster and conflict are mutually reinforcing and conflict can heighten disaster risk by weakening government capacity, while disaster risk can exacerbate existing tensions. So at the Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery, we come at the, the challenge, if you will, from a disaster risk management point of view. And in a sense, we attempt to contribute our know-how, our technical capacity and, and the grant resources that we can mobilize uh, to provide a technical input related to risk management that's relevant in the particular context that uh, exists in a, in, a, in a fragile environment. We don't do this in isolation, of course. We're part of a much larger organization, the World Bank Group, um, that has a number of additional tools that approach uh, the challenges in an FCV context, uh, of course, much more broadly than from our somewhat limited, but nevertheless rather important technical perspective. For instance, our institution applies the risk and resilience assessment, um, generally speaking, as an entry point engagement at an aggregate level when we engage. Now, we have uh, from the GFTR, we have invested the grant resources in fragile and conflict affected countries since our inception, probably around 140 million in total across 35 some countries in the past decade. In a sense, it's a lot of money over a decade in the bigger scheme of things. It's, it's really not that much money, but it has provided a lot of learning, a lot of trial and error. Uh, hopefully some progress in many of the places where what we have supported. And we seek to make our ability to generate world-class technical knowledge in most aspects of disaster risk management more impactful under the specific governance, social and political dynamics that exist in FCV context, which requires adapting approaches, of course, what works in a in a, in a high capacity context does not necessarily work in a lower capacity context. So it's a lot about how can we still bring in the technical know-how, the, the expertise and the resources and the relations that we can generate, but make them relevant in this particular context. It's now uh, integrated into our forward-looking strategies. We will be able, hopefully, to do much more of that. And just quickly on what have we learned? I think primarily we have learned to be flexible. Um, a more fragile environment 
basically means it's more likely that the approach you've set out to do is not going to work. You're going to have to adjust. And, and we have learned that and tried to adjust. We've done a lot of trial and error, I think. Uh, we need to become better at learning collectively. Uh, the 35 some engagement countries where we where we active, we need to be able to learn across them, not just one by one. Um, and we need to become better at connecting the work of the humanitarian partners with our own work as a development partner, including becoming better at working with civil society organizations at a technical level when, when governance may be lagging some of the governance and, and capacity to address some of the challenging that populations are seeking our support for. I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Niels, and, and thank you for sharing those those learning points, particularly that need to be flexible and um, from sort of learning from other communities, not just within within your own programme, but beyond that. And that sort of actually leads me to the next speaker. So, Catherine, um, could we hear perhaps from your perspective, from that climate security kind of peace building mm -hmm. lens? Yep. Th thanks so much, Rebecca, and thanks again to um, ODI and BMZ for, for convening us. Um, I think, as you said at the beginning, you know, there's been a great deal of attention uh, and far more research on the climate, peace and security nexus. Um, a lot of this, however, has focused um, very much on causality as opposed to operational responses. And I think this really is the gap for us, um, primarily because we already have um, sufficient data to, to take action, to start thinking um, beyond, um, again, this relationship, which we know is not direct and which we, we know, um, you know, and where we know already that the multiplier effects are of such great magnitude that we already have to start thinking um, about how we can climate proof prevention, peace building and post stabilization work, understanding that a lot of this work takes place um, in contexts which are highly exposed um, and vulnerable to climate change. And then, then on the other hand, um, in terms of our nature, climate and energy work, um, that we are not only doing no harm, but doing some good as well, that um, our um, climate change uh, mitigation, adaptation uh, work, solutions for, for, for adaptation, mitigation and access to water can, um, in the practice of environmental peace building, um, contribute positively to peace. I, I think, you know, there are critical gaps that we need to address here. At the same time, um, increased analysis somehow hasn't uh, contributed to increased policy coherence. I mean, we see now that peace and security actors um, the Security Council, for example, also the African Union Commission, there's a greater attention among them to uh, climate risk for peace and security. But on the other hand, we have not yet seen global climate governance addressing peace and security risks of climate um, in the same way. I think, um, as colleagues um, have mentioned already, you know, there's, um, and, you know, if you look, for, for example, at the latest report from the IPCC, the Sixth Assessment Report, it does also point to uh, institutions and institutionalization as being very important. To, um, to wider cooperation um, on the nexus of, of climate change, um, environment, peace and security. Um, and without this institutionalization, you know, we are, we are still underprepared um, when there really is a greater uh, need to, uh, to work more deliberately on so solutions for adaptation and peace building, um, to make sure that we are um, incorporating both sets of considerations in, in design um, uh, and in, in onset and not kind of in an ad, ad hoc way. Um, and at the same time, also focusing on, on metrics as well. Um, just as one uh, quick thought here as well, um, I would say we often neglect the reverse linkage, and that is conflict um, and fragility. They can also be an obstacle to climate action. And so we see um, contexts which are most vulnerable to conflict um, and fragility, and also climate change at the same time being amongst the lowest recipients of, of climate finance. And that's something that we need to address as well. Um, thank you very much, um, Catherine. Yeah, I mean, you make some important points there, sort of around how much data do we need? And I guess, as you said, that's what I was sort of alluding to at the start of the uh, of the event. You know, one can sometimes be paralysed by the need to keep collecting data. Um, so we need to be able to decide when we're going to say that's enough and now we need to take action. And then also, as you say, we're not seeing much in terms of the global um, climate governance addressing some of these peace and security issues. So, for example, within UNFCCC, um, fragile and conflict affected states don't necessarily have the same um, cohesive voice that maybe the SIDS, um, et cetera, do. Um, Dieter, could I just turn to you now from a sort of programme um, perspective? Um, and then Catherine, actually, I have a, a quick follow up question to, to one of the points you made. But Dieter, can I turn to you first? 
Yes, of course. Uh, and uh, thank you very much also for having me on this panel and uh, to be able to present some of the lessons learned from our Frexus project, which maybe has a bit of a different angle to the whole uh, discussion we have, but uh, interestingly combines a lot of the things which we have uh, already heard from the keynote speakers and also the, my two colleague panelists. So first of all, the Frexus project, just as an introduction. So it is basically combining the different issues we just heard. So it aims to improve security and climate resilience in the fragile context through the water energy food nexus. So we are combining different sectors uh, in water energy food and then look into a fragile context and add climate resilience to it. So it's definitely what we have heard about creating synergies between sectors, but also creating synergies between um, conflict sensitive and climate sensitive management of land, natural resources, and ecosystems with a strong focus on communities. And uh, maybe let me start with that as one of the first lessons learned what we have seen in our project. When we started the project, um, the first objective was actually really to get a clear picture on how natural resources, climate change and conflicts are linked in our intervention areas. So if you want, we wanted to get to the bottom of it. Why? Because of course, and we have heard a lot of data collection has taken place and also the, the links between uh, the, the climate change conflicts natural resource management has been elaborated already um, and has been already in, 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 in on scientific base but also in, in the reality shown as, as very relevant but we wanted to see what are the entry points uh, the so-called peace drivers uh, in our intervention areas uh, when it comes to this management of natural resources climate change and conflict and what can be the solutions that can be implemented so we are working and um, so uh, um, um, we are working in countries which you have been mentioned uh, as well, Madame Kuruma, uh, in Mali, Chad, and Niger. And um, so finding the key peace drivers uh, was really crucial. And so what we did was, be, besides developing baseline studies uh, con uh, regarding conflict and climate risks, we also developed jointly with the Water Peace and Security Partnership a uh, global and analytical tool a local analytical tool to be able to better predict potential conflicts. That was one side. But what was really extremely important uh, was that, in particular for the local tool, uh, that it was uh, being co-developed with community groups. So we were using and having a lot of uh, discussions, uh, focal group uh, meetings with community groups, with different, and you have also mentioned it, uh, uh, Madame Koroma, the uh, herders, um, the farmers, brought them together and started discussion on really very local level about what are the, 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 the base causes, what are the effects, how are the things linked? And, and by this, uh, we were able to identify in these kind of cause loops, uh, instead of maybe often used uh, linear approach models, uh, to identify um, yeah, key drivers. And uh, with this also develop a common vision of the current situation, not a vision which was our vision, not a vision which was a vision of a model, but in, in the end, it was a vision of the communities on the ground on what are the problems and what might be potential actions to overcome of a female mayor of a, a rural community uh, in, in Niger on the added value of such a, another development project tackling the complex issue of tensions um, between the farmers and herders. Uh, now, having developed part of the development process, um, she's really engaged and uh, she's actually co-driving the process because she noticed that the key stakeholders managed to discuss these tensions and uh, they never did it in, in a way before. So, um, for example, last week, uh, they were able to develop a local convention of management of pastoral areas, which were jointly used. And um, so the farmers agreed even to have construction of new water wells, which were meant to help the, the herders, because that, that it was not news to them, that it was important, but the news was that they actually were discussing it directly with the herders, and they were, it was not seen as something coming from a national level uh, intervention, which uh, was always seen as being uh, promoting the herders at their expense. So the first maybe important lesson learned for really bringing things together is really um, it's a co-creation process to identify the, the needed interventions. It is a, a process where uh, we don't have to bring solutions from the capital of the countries. We really have to look into the, uh, the aspects on, on the ground. Thank you very much. Um, and I think your point about co-creation is key. I mean, we hear, hear that phrase a lot um, in the kind of development space, but I think it's really important to sort of unpick what that means in practice. And, and, and you just did that for us. And um, that 
as you said, it's not about your vision or your solution. It's about really getting and hearing what the local community's priorities are, what are their decision-making priorities, what are their, the threats that they're facing, and then developing the solutions um, together to um, address those. And that sort of leads me on a, a little bit to the question I just had a follow-up for Catherine. Um, actually, I'll be honest, it, it was a blog um, that I read of yours um, where you talked about the ways in which um, conflict can increase, um, obviously, climate and disaster risk, but yet, DRR and climate programs are not always available in um, fragile mm -hmm. and conflict affected areas. So is perhaps the way we keep talking about some of these countries and, and describing them as, as high risk, very fragile, is that to some extent perhaps deterring um, the investment and the intervention that, that needs to happen? Um, just your, your thoughts on that. Yes, th thanks so much, um, Rebecca, for flagging this um, as well, and, and um, I work in this space as well. I think, you know, um, I work as UNDP, uh, the Climate Security Mechanism, has um, also benefited from the insights um, of the, the work that's currently ongoing and being conducted by ODI um, and Spark in this place as well. And as you said, uh, climate finance, um, um, perhaps like other forms of development finance, or tends to, tends to be quite risk averse, um, and um, of course we need to focus on mal maladaptation. You know, the, again going back to the sixth assessment report, it notices um, the highest reported incidence of um, maladaptation across sectors and across regions um, compared to um, the fifth assessment report. Um, and this is critically important that we avoid maladaptation um, um, in the onset. But at the same time, a focus on maladaptation alone won't help us um, increase climate finance. Again, understanding that um, you know, the lowest recipients of climate finance not only include low-income countries, but also high-income countries in the Middle East, which are suffering from conflict, and also conflict-affected middle-income countries in other regions at the same time as well. And so um, I think you know, the, the imperative here is also, um, again, not only focusing on maladaptation, um, delivering on international commitments. We've talked about the $100 billion a year uh, uh, target since Copenhagen. Um, but without uh, addressing the barriers uh, to access for conflict affected in a gradual context, absolute increases in climate finance alone likely won't make a difference um, because they still won't have access to them. So I think there's um, an imperative here. And when we're talking about barriers to access, um, we can talk about um, gov the, you know, challenges related to governance, related to institutions, the complexity in accessing finance. Um, but at, at the same time, you know, we also need to um, understand you know, that um, the very assets that um, an infrastructure that countries need to adapt to climate, climate change um, can be uh, affected, can be actively targeted by conflict, sometimes, sometimes um, in intentionally um, as well. And I think this is important. Um, at, the, at the same time, um, I think there's a need not only to focus on co-cost, but also on co-benefits, understanding that you know, there, are, there are very many good examples um, of climate action, of adaptation and mitigation efforts, which are creating positive co-benefits um, for peace, stability, and security. And we need to start creating metrics around this as well, making sure that we are monitoring co-benefits, both qualitatively and quantitatively, to make sure that we are incentivizing the right types of investment in, in climate change, uh, climate action with co-benefits for peace, stability, and security. Um, thank you very much, Catherine. Um, I'm a bit conscious of time, but I do have a, a few more questions that I want to put um, to the panelists. Um, and I think what I'm hearing is that by shifting this sort of the narratives to a focus on fragilities and vulnerabilities, actually, we can start to find entry points um, to meaningfully address um, some of the most immediate needs, but also the longer term. So my second question um, to the panelists, and, and I ask you to be succinct in your responses, um, how can we bridge the gaps and move forward to working together to prevent the crises? meet immediate needs and then address as well those drivers of fragility and vulnerability to build um, that longer term uh, resilience. Um, Niels, you know, your, your, um, the, the Global Programme on Disaster Conflict is, is supporting efforts um, to develop this cross um, fertilization and collaboration around across DRR, conflict pre prevention and peace, kill, peace building. Um, so perhaps I could ask you to sort of answer that question in the first instance. Thanks, yes, uh, though I won't pretend that I can give you a full answer to, to the complex question. No? Um, I, 
we are attempting, and I think a key part of that uh, is to is addressing this risk averseness that 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 another panelist mentioned. It's a bit of a paradox, you know, that in development financing there's not a willingness to to fail because it's the very basis for innovation, uh, and even more so in a fragile context. Um, and I do think we, as a trust fund uh, and a technical partnership, a global facility. We have a position that allows us maybe a higher failure rate than regular development financing. And, and that's what we're trying to apply to basically help innovate faster, try more things, learn from them, both when they succeed and when they fail. Um, and in doing so, it's important that we can mobilize best available knowledge and climate and disaster risk management globally, which I think we're in a strong position to do but make it available locally, adapted to the FCB context, uh, both through the World Bank, probably primarily through the World Bank as an institution, but also in delivery through the partners that we partner with in most of the FCB countries where we're working. So we are trying at a, at a global level on the knowledge side as a pro, uh, program you're referring to, to, to figure out what are these specific tools, knowledge pieces that we can make use of and that makes sense on the ground. Uh, and we can generate those and, and, and improve on those because we have the, the, the global position. No? So in a sense, we become, or we hope we become a knowledge broker if we do a good job to help drive uh, impact on the ground. We focus on, on the four Ps, if you will, and the, and the World Bank's FCB strategy on policies, programming, personal, and, and partnership. So that's part of the delivery model. We have been piloting engagements and learned from uh, Sudan and Somalia and other places. And we then pull that together and try to put it back into where it's relevant in, a, in, a, in another FCB context. Um, maybe one last thought on that. Uh, but strengthening the evidence base here is key. There's really not a lot of data uh, to work with when we try to help inform decisions that need to be made, whether at a local level or at a national level in an FCD context, and becoming better at using available data and generating new data and being able to do it faster, data that's actionable and relevant uh, is super complicated, but, but absolutely needed. Thanks. Thank you. And, and I think you end on a very important point there, data that is actionable um, and relevant to, to decision making. Yeah, that, that's really key. And um, perhaps then, Dita, that's a nice segue um, to you in terms of your experience in terms of bridging the gaps um, around the, the water security resilience nexus. Yes, uh, thank you. Well, maybe just also on the last point about the data, definitely, I think data information, which is credible for the decision makers is key to have it generated. Uh, and I think, again, coming back to my previous point to link, therefore, tools which can generate this data with local knowledge, I think, can uh, can support what you have just mentioned, Niels, together with the local partners uh, for the implementation on the ground, that kind of um, awareness of our policy makers about that, that, that they, we need to bridge that gap, that this gap exists. And we, so I would also add actually the, 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 the sectoral borders, which we are often facing. And sectoral, of course, on the one hand, what we have just discussed also between the conflict uh, uh, programs and climate uh, change programs. But then in particular now, if you look at our program um, on the ground, also the sectors like water, energy, food. Uh, so where beyond, besides the pure, if you want, the, the conflict I've just described between farmers and herders, um, we actually also have this kind of uh, yeah, competition for water resources uh, uh, between the sectors. And so basically to, to look into, if you want, like, joint risk assessments, uh, joint uh, assessments and, and, and an analysis, not only from one sector, but really bringing it also across to other sectors. It is complex. And um, we have a different Nexus project also outside the, the, the fragility context, uh, where we see it's already difficult just to bring in these three sectors. But still, I think it is a, a worthwhile and very important uh, 
uh, approach to basically create that uh, these tools and the joint understanding to be able to bridge these gaps uh, you have just mentioned. And my final point is maybe, and I think Niels mentioned it as well, uh, partnerships uh, on glo local uh, global level combined with partnerships on on local level. I think that's uh, that's a, a key key instrument or key approach. And in our case, so we are working on on a global level, as I've said, with the Water Peace and Security Partnership. Um, but then also we have close links through them, but also with, for example, the Federation of Unions of Farmers Groups uh, in Niger or the Federation of Livestock Breeders, uh, in particular in, in a certain region, um, where, we, where we see that these connections are very helpful you know, to bring to the ground um, the experience we have and give the feedback back to the, to the global level partnership. I think this link, as, as Niels has mentioned, global uh, and local link is key. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, yeah, so yeah, linking back the, the local to the global. And then I think also, um, as was mentioned by um, um, Madam Kimura in terms of the regional as well. So it's that integration um, between, between all of those. Um, Catherine, um, and to you um, now from, again, your experience from the peace building perspective, what do you see are those key gaps that need to be bridged? You touched on a few um, in your previous comments, but um, just to invite you to address this question. Thanks so much, Rebecca. I think there's already been some excellent points um, by Tita and Neil just now, but um, I would add in addition to those, um, in terms of our work as the climate security mechanism, being able to work on different tracks. Um, we have DPPA um, and DPO, uh, which backs up the special political missions and peace operations. UNDP um, is the largest implementer of uh, both climate action, prevention and, and peace building within the UN system, um, and UNEP, which leads on um, environmental data and analytics. So I think being able to work across these silos as well, um, an institutional home, if you like, for climate security within the UN system. Um, in addition to a strong focus on learning um, and data, I think um, the kind of um, interregional knowledge exchanges is, is really important, um, as also um, highlighted just now as well. In addition, we have a community of practice within the UN system, which comprises more than 30 UN entities and uh, 300 uh, members at headquarters in the field as well. So again, that exchange and that kind of trying to foster that, that um, policy practice feedback loop. Um, on, on the ground at a local level, I think it's really important, you know, to engage peace building actors and local peace building networks in our work as well. And that's something that we're doing, for example, um, the Liptapo Gorma uh, region, um, but also Uganda um, and, and Zimbabwe. I think collecting data, as we said, at the different levels as well, um, starting with a common, a common understanding, um, and that can be achieved through um, integrated analysis and assessment, and we have a conceptual approach um, and toolbox, toolbox um, to this effect as well. Um, and I think one of the last points I would make would just be um, underserved regions. You know, we have uh, countries and regions which are high priority now in terms of as being affected by conflict, by crisis, where we are working on peace building and stabilization, but a longer term lens um, to those uh, countries which uh, may be at risk, or, um, those on the kind of border prevention agenda. Um, at the same time, um, understanding, you know, that some of the the worst manifestations of, of climate change are yet to come and we need to try to think about how we can better integrate strategic foresight for example um, in, into into analysis and assessment as well yeah thank you and um, just quickly on that point about um foresight um i don't know whether neils or, or or data want to come back on this but you know at the sort of programmatic level how is that being um carried out and how can that then going back to the point about better data for decision making how can um, this sort of foresight capacities be um, used by decision makers well in a sense i think most disaster risk management builds on elements of foresight no we we attempt to analyze use the available data generate data to help us understand probabilities and likelihoods of of future events occurring and and then we drive planning and investment policies and uh, processes to try to deal with that. So, so in, in that sense, I think foresight is, uh, is well integrated. Um, foresight in longer perspective, of course, comes with a very large amount of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this large amount of uncertainty challenges certainly the equation we talked about a little earlier about the, the risk averseness. No? Uh, mm -hmm. It's very hard to define development interventions that for sure work, <laughs> it's almost impossible. Mm -hmm. uh, and the further ahead we attempt to have foresight, if we don't accept the amount of uncertainty that comes with those attempts of foresight, then 
then we're fooling ourselves. Um, so I guess it's just a, a way of saying, I, I think we're operating in that space, but it, it comes with some very significant uncertainties. Yes, and, and I think that's the, uh, that's the challenge, isn't it? Been able to take these contacts where, where, the, where you need to have a high degree of, of risk taking, you need to accept a high degree of uncertainty, but these things are not necessarily um, the, the favorite, favorite approaches of, of, of donors um, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to accept um, that. Um, Dieter, I, I know your connection's a little bit weak, um, but if you can want, want just to, 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 I, to think about from the program, programmatic level um, in terms of next steps. I purposely went from home office to my office in Bonn uh, to improve the connection, but it seems it has even gotten worse. <laughs> uh, never mind. Um, yeah, maybe to add on that uh, issue with uh, the, the foresight and the information available, and then also the, towards the next steps. So one important player, which is sometimes difficult to tackle and difficult to basically integrate, is, of course, are the, the security stakeholders as well. Um, and we know they quite often speak maybe a bit of a different language in a figurative sense. Um, and uh, they have uh, quite often little experience with natural resource, climate change topics and management. But in, in the end, uh, it is important uh, to see that uh, they play an important role in, in, in using uh, data and information from this kind of foresight processes. And um, so therefore, we see them uh, that it's uh, important to, to involve them, but also provide the information which comes out of these kind of models and the data in a way uh, which is uh, yeah, basically uh, yeah, in, in, in their language, if you want. At the same hand, at the same time, uh, being very considerate that uh, sometimes uh, the, the security stakeholders can also be seen as part of some of the, the problems uh, for uh, for conflict. So this is the balance we have to go. But in the end, I think um, uh, they are an important uh, element in the equation and we need to be able to, to, uh, to convey the message which is, which is coming out of the data and, uh, and the models uh, to them in a way that they are also seeing them as, okay, this is now important for us and we need to basically work together with the other stakeholders uh, to deal with the issue. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So unfortunately, that brings us um, towards the end of our event, but I just wanted to kind of recap on, on some of the major points that I think have, have come out. Um, I think State Secretary Flasbot sort of opened this session by you know, saying that fragility is a, is a global challenge. Um, and you know, if we are going to address that, we need to accept um, the uncertainty um, that comes with that and we need to accept and move on from this idea that it's complicated. It's a com fragile and conflict affected areas, a complex context. It's too difficult. You know, how can we invest? How can we in develop programs when, we do when we're uncertain about the very concrete um, outcomes that we expect to see? So we can't actually anymore in this new kind of for context that we are in, we cannot keep using that as an excuse. So we have to break down this um, action gap. And I think we've heard in some of the ways that we're trying to do that today. We need credible data um, for decision making. We've heard from all of the keynote um, speakers about the importance of, of greater um, coordination and integration. Um, this importance um, of bringing together development, climate and humanitarian actors, we need to all start speaking um, the same language um, and building coherence from the local to the global um, and vice versa. I mean, at the moment, I think there is still too much of a gap between uh, the global um, debates um, from Sendai framework to the ongoing processes within UNFCCC and, um, for example, Santiago Network, Glasgow Sharmal Shape Work Programme, the Global Goal on Adaptation, um, as well as the global compact on migration and the grand bargain. So we need to have better coherence um, uh, across those. And we need, I think, as well, you know, we've heard about giving voices um, at the local and community level, but then also giving voices to um, 
these the fragile and complex factored areas in processes such as UNFCCC, um, so that actually they too can um, help understand how we can can bring together some of the financing and address some of those back barriers to bringing financing, whether it be from the climate funds or private investment, to address some of the challenges that are needed. And as Madam Kamora, you know, rightly pointed out. It's the issues of food, it's livelihood, it's peace and security. So these are coming together. These are the priorities that the countries themselves are facing. So our programming can no longer just be operating in silos. We can't just be doing climate adaptation or DRR programming or peace building. These need to have high degrees um, of integration. Um, so on that note, I really would like to thank um, our keynote speakers, Mr. Jochen Flasbart, Secretary of State um, and Vice President, Madam Finder Kamora, and also to our panellists, um, Mr. Niels Holm Nielsen, um, Catherine Wong and Dieter Ruttenberger. Thank you so much. And also thank you um, to our audiences um, for listening and participating. And apologies again um, for some of the um, technical um, challenges um, that we face throughout the session. But thanks so much for your patience um, in dealing with those. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.